Let me rewind back to that wild speculation of mine from the previous video that Mark was writing a deliberate work of fiction. Why this has a bearing on the resurrection question should be obvious. If Mark's story is fictional and the other three Gospels derive from Mark's tale, then we have eliminated all four Gospels from the equation, which then leaves the other New Testament writings, such as Paul's letters and so forth. But the question we all need to ask when any supposedly far-fetched conclusion such as this is presented is, what evidence can we lay on the table to support this claim? Is there anything of substance that we could present that would show beyond a reasonable doubt that Mark was writing fiction? Funny you should ask. One piece of evidence that supports this idea is that Mark, the earliest gospel, has all the earmarks of a work of fiction. It's written in the third person with an omniscient narrator. One good example of the fictional nature of Mark is when Mark recounts Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Everyone present who could have heard what Jesus prayed was allegedly asleep. How did Mark know what Jesus said if everyone was asleep? It's the omniscient narrator at work. The author of a work of fiction always knows what his characters are thinking and doing at all times. Mark also contains literary techniques and motifs, and its form matches a specific type of ancient fiction known as a hero biography. This was a common form of fiction in the Greco-Roman world. The Odyssey by Homer is a perfect example of this. The hero, Odysseus, goes on many adventures and undergoes many trials and sufferings and eventually comes out victorious. But an even stronger piece of evidence that Mark has given us a fictional tale is that Mark has not just framed the life of Jesus as a hero biography, similar to the Odyssey, but has actually drawn details and motifs directly from Homer's Odyssey. Mark also draws from the Greek mythologies, the Greek translation of the Jewish Old Testament known as the Septuagint, as well as contemporary traditions about Jesus in order to form scenes in his own mini-epic. Just as Homer wrote of the adventures of Odysseus and his crew members, Mark has penned some amazing adventures of Jesus and his disciples, with a little help from Homer, and Mark has cleverly hidden some flags inside his work to alert the more astute readers of his day to what he had done. We might be tempted to call this a tip of the hat to Homer, except that Mark has not just taken a bit here or there. He's used the Odyssey as a kind of blueprint which guides his own story in not only the huge sweeping motifs, but unusual details as well. Rewriting a previous story and changing the characters was a common practice in more ancient times long before the idea of copyright. The works of Homer had been in circulation roughly 800 years by the time Mark penned his story, and these Greek tales were well known by anyone educated in reading and writing Greek as Mark clearly was. By Mark's day, Homer was in the air, so to speak. Not only are these parallels numerous, they are also unusual in character and carry astonishing explanatory power regarding many of the enigmatic passages we find in Mark. The thesis that Mark used scenes and concepts from Homer actually explains many of the oddities we find in Mark, which seem to defy explanation, such as the naked young man running away from Jesus, why Jesus would curse a fig tree out of season, why Jesus was crucified between two criminals and not on either side of them, why the feeding of the 5,000 entailed only male guests, why the chief priest needed Judas to identify Jesus when Jesus had been debating the chief priest in the temple and showing himself publicly on many occasions, why Jesus made such a big deal over keeping his identity secret through the entire gospel, why he traveled by ship so often in Mark, but not in the other three Gospels. 
Why James and John are treated as veritable Siamese twins with no volition of their own, and why Jesus renamed them to the Sons of Thunder. How an anonymous woman would gain worldwide fame, and so on. So, buckle your seatbelts and no smoking. We're about to go where no resurrection debate video has gone before. <laughs>